Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending this webinar featuring the work done at Bellsville by Samuel Aban. My name is Pat Bono, president of New York Bee Wellness, which is an independent educational grassroots charitable 501c3 organization. Its mission is to educate small scale, sideliner, and beginning beekeepers. We do have a YouTube site with past in person and online presentations. We also conduct statewide surveys twice a year for non migratory beekeepers in New York State. 2021 is our seventh year of collecting data. New York Bee Wellness also sends out newsletters several times a year. All right, thank you very much. And uh, Samuel, you, you are on. Thank you. I thank you, Pat, for inviting me um, this evening to share um, our uh, work at the Bee Lab and also the diagnostic service that we provide at the um, diagnostic lab at the Bee Research Laboratory. Um, um, we have been in existence for almost 100 years. Uh, that's a long time, um, but the mission has stayed relatively the same, um, providing service to beekeepers um, and looking for novel um, ideas, controls uh, to help combat the effect of pests and disease that impact on the bee health. And so I will expand on those ideas further, um, but for um, mainly focus on how the major brood disease that we frequently diagnose at the bee lab, and also some of the techniques that we employ to identify those pests and disease, and um, also options that are available to treat um, colonies. Um, as we all know, there are many reasons where colonies are failing, um, where big beekeepers are having difficulty um, managing colonies. And those have been identified um, many years now, and we are still working on trying to find treatment and controls to combat those impacts on honeybee health. Um, uh, we know for um, lack of forage, um, poor diet, um, pest, pesticides, um, looking at fungicides, um, all those exposures uh, impact honeybee health. And so there's the, the, the research component of the bee research lab um, primarily focuses on combating those areas that are really impacted, impacted honeybee health. And so I will, I will um, further elaborate on some of those um, efforts that the lab is um, carrying out. And to start off, we have um, Judy Cheng Labs. Um, she is currently our research leader. Uh, she's a virologist and she's um, focusing on mainly her work on looking at viral, different viruses that are affecting honeybee health. So in terms of looking at the impact of deformed wing viruses, looking at uh, um, um, uh, looking at other viruses uh, um, that are on and queen, um, black queen cell viruses and other um, viruses that are impact on the bee health. Um, we have Steve Cook's lab. Um, he's looking at the physiology, um, the, the stresses that brought about from um, bee in absorbing chemicals, pesticides, fungicides, um, mighty size and how those um, those those impact the physiological organs of the honeybees, and in terms of absorption and excretion. So, are those um, chemicals are they impacting um, the honeybee system and inhibit them from actually reducing their lifespan, um, reducing their the ability to go out and forage uh, and collecting nectars or pollen. Um, on the other hand, we have uh, Miguel Corona's lab and he's um, looking at nutrition. Um, what are the components of the pollen that are being, bees are collecting? Um, what are the other sources 
of nutrients that bees needed in terms of development, in terms of brood rearing, and also in terms of longevity. And um, is there anything that um, bee such can improve such as supplements, um, in terms of um, vitamins and other nutrients, um, proteins, carbohydrates, um, are those can impact or improve the health of honeybees. Um, also, we have um, um, Dr. Abu Raki. Um, he's also a new um, researcher at the Bee Lab, and he's um, primarily focusing on uh, queen health and uh, idea um, improving the diversity of the genes and to improve the um, the whole colony. Uh, we have um, Jay Evans um, and also a visiting scientist, um, Raymond Pat Patterson, and probably some of you are familiar with Jerry Hayes' work also. Um, recently, they have teamed up to looking at um, how um, commercial products in, in terms of diagnostic and therapeutics um, to help improve on AB health. As we know, there's um, like female gel and B uh, has been out of the market. And not pro the company is not producing anymore. But uh, what are the diagnostic tools that are available that are different for what is already currently being used? Um, there are other therapeutic that can replace it to um, actually treat and also to actually detect disease um, if impact of pests quicker to help the beekeepers actually improve their management um, practices. Um, so I'll move on now to the um, actual diagnostic lab itself and um, specifically the work that we, uh, we do at the diagnostic lab. Uh, for the most part, we don't charge for the services that we provide. Um, a few years ago, I, um, I saw a survey from um, um, in, in the API inspectors of America and um, asking their members um, about the different labs and the services they provide. And, and the survey result shows that the the, the diagnostic lab is still the premier number one reference lab for um, inspectors. So that's where they send in samples. Um, it's am it amazed me because um, for over 100 years now I've been in existence, we still are the permanent lab in, in terms of uh, forefront in terms of um, research and diagnostics. And, and I'm, I'm sure I want to think that it's not because the service is free, but I, I'm, I'm, I still think that it's because of the, the types of service that we, we provide for beekeeper. And forum like this in help us highlight um, and educate beekeepers and the community about the, the work we do at the lab and also having a, a two-way conversation about how to improve service and, and deliver service uh, to beekeepers. Um, for the most part, we, we on, on average, we, we receive about um, 2,500 2, samples a year. Um, compared to the amount of colonies out there, that's just a tiny amount of samples. However, um, most of the samples that we, we receive are sent in by just um, hobby beekeepers, um, and also state inspectors uh, for states that have um, API inspection um, services. Um, um, we usually um, turn around sample within a week. Um, however, due to the ongoing pandemic, um, that's not possible. Um, we have actually scaled back on the services that we provide, but our core function um, uh, and our, our focus is mainly to reduce um, the spread of diseases across um, apiary and across state lines. So we, we still have the open the service and, and we try to uh, um, provide emergency service for 
beekeepers and state inspectors who look into diagnose um, uh, especially American firewood or European firewood. Um, just in 2019, which um, probably one of the um, in the recent year that we have a full um, year of, of work, um, we we, we um, process about um, 2,563 samples, and of those samples, we have about 37 percent were adult um, brood samples. So that would be comb, smear, um, that were sent in for brood disease analysis. Um, a majority of the sample were adult bees that we received and those were examined for Nuzima and Varroa mite um, levels. Um, we have other samples that usually comes in um, just made up of pollen, honey, um, beetles. Um, so I'll, I'll move on now to focus on um, the major brood diseases that I, um, I'm sure uh, in, our, in the minds of many um, beekeepers and inspectors. Um, so to start off, we have American firewood, uh, which primarily is a uh, main concern for most beekeepers. Um, also, um, European firewood is still a threat to honeybee colonies, uh, truck wood to a lesser extent, and, and less so is um, sackwood disease. So firewood disease uh, is still prevalent in different states. Um, there's, um, some states have more um, European firewood, some are more impacted by American firewood, but for the most part, um, say in the um, Northeast area, especially in New York, uh, American firewood is more of a concern for beekeepers. Um, nationwide, about 3% of of colonies are reported in, in, infected by American firewood. So we can see here's a proportion of American uh, and European firewood. Um, and this is from uh, um, colony, colonies in the, in the UK and Wales, but it still applies here in the US in, in many colonies as well. And when we can see on the top, um, line, we see um, European firewood um, in a descent and then in the incline again, where American firewood has been plateauing going down over the years. And we can see this phenomenon here in the US and in some states where uh, there's some, some years there'll be a rise in European firewood and um, less so of American firewood in some states. Um, I mean, the main goal is for beekeepers to, to have healthy colony. Um, having healthy colony um, have its, its benefits. Um, um, beekeepers um, want to have colonies and, um, producing um, healthy bees, and those healthy bees uh, can go on to produce um, pollen, uh, to go forage and bring in nectars, um, pollen, and also um, prepare for the next generation and to keep the colony going. Uh, bees goes out there and collect pollen and nectar and, and honey. But what happened when um, the bee is no longer able to do so? Uh, and mainly they're impacted by disease or pest. And so the colony will not thrive. Uh, one of the main reasons for that will be um, if they're impacted by disease such as American fibroid. Um, this disease is a spore forming, forming um, bacterial disease. And a cell can produce up to 2.5 billion spores. And so the disease is highly contagious and it can easily spread in the colony, within colonies, and also to adjacent um, hives. Um, usually, over time, it can kill the colony. Um, just in um, 2019, as reference, about 25% of the samples that we received were diagnosed with this disease. Um, and we can see in the, when you go inspect a hive, we can definitely see the progress of the disease and 
a hive. And, and one of the signs that we, we see is that um, the, the, the comb itself will not be um, uniform in terms of the, the disease progression. And also we can see that the, the combs, the, um, there are some cells that we have um, caps that have been sunken in. Um, the brood actually will stop developing and then the spores will consume the whole larva. Um, and eventually it will divide the whole larva. Um, in some cases, um, beekeeper can able to actually do a field test by just using a, a Q-tip swab and, um, and, and select a cell to test. And it, um, the actual larva will be kind of molted down and then just pull out, pull out like a string. Um, as the disease progress, um, the, the spore will actually consume all the tissue and then the it would, it would the actual form a scale that would adhere to the side of the cells. Um, and your pre and fab will also cause a great deal of problem for beekeepers. Um, so this disease is actually a non-spore forming bacteria. Um, it's less contagious than European fab, than American fab. Um, it's been said that it's brought about um, due to stress in the colony, um, but normally it doesn't kill the colonies. Um, the other organism that can actually be present at the same time, and, and those are associated organisms that don't, does not cause the disease, but that also can be um, found um, um, side by side with the um, causative organism, which is Melisococcus plutonius. Um, there is usually a higher proportion of um, European fibro diagnosis in the lab. And just like in 2019, uh, about 24% of the samples were diagnosed uh, with this disease. Um, it, it tends the symptomic symptoms um, varies differently in the in the comb. Um, usually there are there will be side by side um, healthy and disease um, cells alongside each other. And so it tends to uh, be difficult to actually do a field diagnosis in some cases because um, most of the cells um, are in generally affect in the early stage of development. Um, we can see in, um, in this comb that um, there's spotty brood pattern, and um, that's uh, one of the also a telltale sign of uh, there's something wrong um, with this um, colony or in particular this uh, um, brood comb. Um, the disease will progress and also form um, what, um, a scale, but in the in generally affecting in the early stages. So usually you'll be finding the bottom of the cell. Um, just for comparison between the two um, disease, uh, most, most of the time, um, big people will have a difficulty identifying the field, uh, just depending on the stage of um, progression of the disease. Uh, but for the most part, um, the odor uh, is one significant um, signs of disease in a colony. And so sometimes um, beekeeper will, will um, express that there's a, you know, find a, a sour smell. And uh, usually this related to um, European fabu, while um, a chicken coop um, type of smell, uh, sulfuric type of odor, um, kind of generally um, related to um, American fabu present in the colony. Uh, like I've, um, said earlier, there's a different stage of, of um, progression on the, of the disease. Um, uh, European firewood um, brood um, disease tend to be twisted. Um, and as it progress, um, usually see the trickier tubes um, it will be visible. Whilst um, in American firewood, usually tends to progress in different, could be early or later stage where the um, the brood is capped, and so the disease will continue um, infecting the colony. 
And so you have different um, stages of um, brood disease um, um, symptoms in those in those cells. So you can have um, uh, um, brood that look um, chocolatey brown to dark, um, and generally you can have perforated um, cells that are present. Uh, excuse um, me, Samuel. Do you want yes. to answer questions as they come in or at the end of the presentation? Um, I can try to, um, to navigate that. Okay. Um, yes, I think I will wait till after the presentation and try to answer some of the okay, questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, and if they don't mind, um, but I would, I would definitely try to get to them. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Okay, I think I've... Um, so in terms of diagnosis at the lab, uh, um, so when we give receive the samples, um, it's pretty much um, um, step by step, like what we can act, what a beekeeper will actually do when they open a hive. So we do a visual um, check of the comb itself, or if it's a comb sample, or if it's a smear sample, then we just um, uh, move on to um, process the sample. But in terms of the comb, we generally look for the signs and symptoms in the cells. And then uh, once we uh, determine um, cells that, uh, that is, um, have a brood disease um, symptom, then we select the cell and we'll for further processing. Nice freezing up here, sorry. Uh, so the first thing we do once we select the cell, uh, we um, we we, we a procedure called like a hang, hang and drop method. So where we transfer the blue cell into um, um, into water, um, making a, a spore solution um, basically, and then we, we put that on the heat lamp to actually uh, dry up the water and actually fix the material onto the slide. Uh, from there, we'll move on to um, use a stain um, for like about 30 seconds, uh, and then we wash off the stain. And then we um, use another um, micros microscope glass, and then we actually um, put this, um, be actually before that, we put a thin layer of oil onto the slide um, before we, we put a cover slip with the material onto the slide. And, and so now we're ready to examine it under the microscope. Um, so we plus the sample under the microscope uh, um, and we're looking at the physical attributes of the, the pathogen. And so we, we're looking, especially for um, American firewood, um, we're looking at uh, the shape. Is it um, oval, twisted? Um, so generally this, the, um, the spores are uniform and they tend to be um, twice as long as in width. And, and, and for the most part, um, was, uh, we look for Brownian movement. So the, the, um, the spores will be moving in a pocket of water. And I will show that in a different slide. Um, for the European firebird, um, since it's a cell-forming bacterial, um, they generally just form a pair of chain or usually there will be clusters uh, and fixed to the slide. And, and so when we, even though we can have uh, a hunch as to what or which of the um, firewood is present, um, the test is still the same and we'll go through the same process in trying to identify the pathogen that is present um, in the sample. Um, and here is a sample of what actually we will see under the microscope um, of a American fibro spores. And um, the spores uh, seen here is actually doing a brownian movement. Um, not to say there's other bacteria that will not be present there, but in general, um, the spores are uniform. Um, like I said, there are billions of spores. So there's no many other bacteria that were present in that, um, in that in that amount in a sample. So we can exclude any other bacteria. Um, 
when this when the sample actually um, the water dries up, um, the the actual American fibers tends to cluster together. Um, however, in the European fabric, um, what you see here is how the um, the spores uh, the cells clusters and in, in a lancet shape. Um, um, earlier, I spoke about the presence of secondary bacterial, and you can see in this slide there is um, um, Penicillus alvea that is present. Um, the presence of this bacterial also um, causes significant difficulty in in some cases trying to distinguish between American and European firewood in in a, in a comb cell. So in, in, in most cases, when we get um, a beekeeper might um, look at a, a colony and infected with um, European firewood, but the presence of penibacillus uh, alvei um, cause them to think maybe they have um, European firewood. And that's because the disease progression also caused the um, cause the same symptoms that looks like American fiber. Um, so this is on this slide, this is another um, secondary bacterial um, brav bravulated spores that's also present um, in association with European fiber. Uh, so the VITA test kits that are available and I'm sure um, some beekeepers or inspectors are using in the field, um, we are also utilizing the lab and primarily um, for European fiber, just as I alluded to earlier, and in some cases where it is, we don't have uh, enough samples or we have, uh, we don't have a comb, we just have a, maybe a Q-tip swab of sample that's not enough to um, run a test. And so we can quickly use the VITA test um, uh, uh, to determine whether we have American or European fiber. And, and there's two, two different kits. So we have, have one for American fiber and also one specific kit for European fiber. Again, um, uh, in some cases, um, you can have where, you know, they mistakenly use the uh, different kits for different disease. And so the outcome uh, get a false negative or false positive. positive on a, a colony. Uh, so what we do after we um, diagnose, especially American firewood, uh, we mostly um, can cultivate the, the spores. Um, in some states, um, it's not necessarily to um, actually cultivate the spores. So they will, uh, would, that would just be just identifying and confirming the disease. And some other states are interested in knowing um, if there's, um, they can treat this colony and depends on the stage of the progression of disease. And so some states will allow for some kind of treatment or uh, uh, in some cases, um, the um, beekeeper may have a multiple hive and they wanna protect those colonies. So it's imperative to know if the actual um, antibiotics that are available, such as oxytexacycline and tylosin, are still in fact effective in protecting those colonies. And so what we do, we we'll carry on a, 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 an assay wherein we will actually test those antibiotics, we test those bacteria to the antibiotics and see if they can be resistant or susceptible to the antibiotics. Um, and so in the process of, uh, we generally just um, make a spot suspension and then we heat shock. And also we can, um, um, we also prepare um, a media, um, exclusive uh, media brain heart infusion agar. And so once we strip the, the plate with the bacteria, we also um, use um, um, a it's a pre uh, um, dose um, disc, the bacteria, the antibiotic comes in. And so we can just um, um, place that onto the media. Okay. So in the result of that, we can see after three days, uh, we can see um, what we have here is, um, 
one uh, one plate, we can see that the the antibodies infecting in prohibiting the undergrowth of the bacteria. On the other plate, we can see that the growth of the bacteria is closer to the disc. And so in this case, the actual um, bacteria is resistant to the antibiotics. And so once we send the report, at least the beekeepers or the inspector we know um, to suggest what kind of antibiotic that's gonna um, be used. Um, just a reference in 2019, about 23% of the samples that we, uh, we diagnosed were resistant to um, oxytetracycline and susceptible to um, tylosine, uh, where 79%, uh, 76% of the sample. So we don't have any, we have, as to date, we don't have any resistance to tylosine, but in some state, um, there have been signs that, um, the antibiotic is um, the American firewood is becoming intolerant to the antibiotics, um, and that's that's because um, there's been um, widely used, and they have exhausted some of the oxytetracycline. Um, so some beekeepers, especially commercial beekeepers, that be using oxytetracycline for years and years, and it's, it's becoming ineffective, and they're switching over to tylosine. And so now we've seen um, much use of tylosine, and that's created great concern because uh, we don't have many options um, in terms of antibiotics. And I would touch on how what the restrictions that have been placed on um, the use of antibiotics, and um, which I think is a good thing to help preserve and, and protect um, um, bee colonies. Um, and so how is American firewood spread in a colony? Um, uh, there's many avenues that um, the American firewood will spread in a colony. Um, one of them will be um, to um, be rubbing each other for food. Um, um, Beekeeper using use equipment uh, or old equipment that have been stored for a while, or purchasing old equipment. Um, so how can we control American firewood? Um, I think the ultimate and most effective way will be um, to just destroying the colony. However, that's created a significant um, financial burden on beekeepers as well, because uh, you know in um, destroying the the beehive, we also destroying um, the the um, the hive body, and also the equipment. Um, sterilization uh, used to be an option for beekeepers, or radiation, uh, steam, or uh, uh, et ethylene oxide uh, fumigation uh, uh, used to be um, be in North Carolina where beekeepers can send in you know, they have to be uh, um, irradiated. Um, that's an expensive, those are expensive proposition for beekeepers as well. So those are not actually um, easy or financially uh, feasible for some beekeepers who may have just one or two hives. Um, maybe commercial beekeepers may use that option. Um, so we left with a mainly, um, Using antibiotics as controls, and and just burning the colon um, infected colonies. But I I want we not recommend uh, using drugs because we will just max the problem and ultimately we build up resistance to the antibiotics. So it's just a matter of time um, after continuous use of antibiotics, the disease will flare up again, and so. If you have other colonies, then you have tendency that you would the disease may, may spread in your apiary. Well, okay. For European firewood, the only control that is available is um, uh, oxytetracycline or, or the brand name uh, teramycin, and it's still effective in controlling um, the disease. Um, Pretty much, you can treat between three times um, in a three days inter in a five days interval, and it's not recommended that to treat um, two weeks before uh, honey flow. 
another um, disease that usually um, is more visible and is is is, is caused by fun fun drug um, chalk food disease and. And smell is easy to diagnose because our um, beekeepers move up to the and the hive. You can see the bees moving the chalkboard off the colonies. And there's no treatment for this disease. Um, and it's recommended that can we queen the colony can help reduce the actual impact of chalkboard in the colony. And uh, sackboard is not some, uh, we don't diagnose um, sackboard as much. Um, and, and it's because because um, we don't we in general don't have um, a fresh um, samples and so if the the sample has been sitting down for a while it will show signs of of disease it may not necessarily be sackboard um, but just because it's been sitting a while so it is difficult for us to actually diagnose and we don't actually use molecular um, tools to actually diagnose samples. So we generally don't actually diagnose this disease. Uh, but mainly it does not cause severe damage to colonies. Um, and it's usually common in the springtime. Um, I'll move on to so, um, some of the diseases of pests that actually impact adult bees. Um, and so one of the main ones we see is um, Nizema disease. Um, this, so this microsporidium um, um, impact the digestive tract of adult bees. It's two species of the disease. However, we don't, we don't carry out any species analysis on, and also you have varroa mites, which is more destructive for colonies um, and continuing to be. Uh, and that's because it actually, you know, transmits viruses and it and also it actually so feed on the adult bees. Um, unless so is going to be tr trachea mites, um, which is an internal mite. Um, become less of a problem lately. And some of the chemicals that are used to treat uh, varroa mites also act on the trachea mites. And so therefore the impact of trachea mites is uh, severely reduced. And so it's, it's less of an issue in bee colonies lately. But however, varroa mites continue to become, continue to be destructive to honeybee health. In, in 2019, we about 45% of the samples that we diagnose have mites on them. Um, average mites that we see about 11.5 mites per 100 bees, uh, which is really high. And so definitely that colonies are struggling in dealing with the impact of varroa mites. Um, uh, we have found up to 137 mites per 100 bees. Well, uh, New Zealand disease, um, about 40% of samples in uh, 2007, 2019 were diagnosed with um, New Zealand disease. Uh, the spores can range from about 50,000 to 129 million spores per bee. Uh, um, uh, 59% of the samples had over a million spores per 100 bee, per, per bee. Um, some of the services that we, um, we don't conduct anymore, um, we don't do any virus testing, or uh, no, we conduct any um, pesticide testing for bees or bee products. Um, there used to be a risk analysis um, identification that are conducted at the, the Tucson Bee Lab, but that service has been discontinued. Um, so uh, that we don't we don't know of any other lab that actually carry out that service. Uh, some are, uh, other margin threat to honeybee health. Uh, we're looking at um, triple A labs, Claria. Um, hopefully, it will stay in Asia and don't get to the US because um, it will be devastating for bee colonies. Um, lately, we hear uh, about the, Asia, the Asian giant hornets 
that is um, making the waves. Um, hopefully, um, uh, we're able to contain it, and it hasn't been seen out of um, Washington State as yet. So, hopefully, we can able to contain it there. Um, I just want to touch on the um, the animal field directive that um, were modified, and 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 as and, and the reason being that. Um, um, is um, we get calls and concern from beekeepers um, in some states that doesn't have an API extension program and what to do with their colonies if they have disease or, or how to find a vet um, to help them with um, prescription. And so the, it's, it's mandated that um, you know, the beekeepers should have a relationship with the veterinarians. Um, and that's a burden because beekeepers, you know, it'd be probably more expensive for them to call a vet than to actually replace the hive. Um, but I found um, just um, and, uh, in, the, in the research, research in uh, West Virginia, and they have adapted the feed directive in a way that makes us less bothersome for beekeepers. Um, and and I, I thought I would share that with, uh, with this group today. Um, and it's, it's, it's mainly the, you know, the beekeepers doesn't have to call any veterinarians to come inspect the colony. Um, they, can, they can get the state inspectors to actually do the inspection, um, sending the diagnosis to the, to the vet and the vet can look at the pictures and the, the disease um, frame, and they can they can actually write a prescription um, for the beekeepers to actually treat the colony. And this is mainly only for um, European fiber because uh, uh, not for uh, American fiber. But I think it's a kind of a, uh, a simpler way and also reduce cost for the beekeeper if they don't have to, uh, the veterinarian don't have to make a call um, a home visit to actually inspect the colony. Um, so how can you submit samples to the lab for diagnosis? Um, you can send in a comb sample. Um, the comb must be um, uh, cut off from the brood chamber area and, um, and, 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 and don't have any honey or pollen present in the, in the comb. And we, we advise that you don't use any, um, any plastic wrap or aluminum foil um, and due to the um, growth of mold. Um, if you can actually um, send in the um, comb, you can also use the probe used to examine the cell, um, so Q-tip swab or the Q-tip, and you can wrap that in paper and send it to the lab for analysis. Uh, you can also send in adult bee samples, um, approximately about 100 bees um, soaking um, in alcohol in a leak proof container. Um, so here's our address and my contact information. Um, so I was just going to summarize, the, uh, um, and I, I know I went to a lot of slides, um, but for my still pose a significant trend to honeybee health. And uh, just because it actually um, uh, actually impact the developing bee and also the adult bees. Um, AFB also still poses a considerable amount of threat to honeybee health. And, and nationwide, a, you know, colonies are beginning to develop um, antibiotic resistant and also adult bees uh, become uh, all, uh, susceptible to the impact of varroa mites. And so my, my decides are less uh, are becoming less and less effective in controlling uh, um, varroa mites. Um, so beekeepers or state inspectors can submit the um, samples directly to the lab for diagnosis. And with that, I will stop here and take some questions or, or answer some of your questions that been posted and so far.
Um, I will start off uh, so a question here. Um, so, um, uh, in your opinion, how prevalent is American fiber in, in U.S. Um, colony? Is it fair to say that most colonies contain AFB spores, but only a tiny percentage of the bacteria? Um, I alluded to that earlier that um, about 3% of colonies are reported to have American fiber. Um, so the second part of your question, um, saying that most colony contain AFB spores, but only tiny percentage have the bacteria. Um, Uh, the majority of the, uh, of the sample that will have AFB will have the bacteria. So there's no actually um, separation between those two. So if they have the, if they have, if the colon is affected with American fiber, definitely we can detect the spores in those colonies. Uh, so also a question about um, real line visual and Q-tip test for AFB. Does does it have a smell that can be related to something a beekeeper will recognize? Um, uh, yes, I, I also talked about um, the smells that is given off from um, the bee, um, the colony when it's affected, infected by American or European firewood. But you know, smell can be subjective. Um, I. I spoke about um, a foul smell, such as a chicken coops um, smell for American fowl, and more like a sour vinegary smell for um, European fowl. Uh, so let's see here. Also, there's a question here about can AFB spores be seen under the microscope without uh, without the use of a stain? Um, yes, it can be seen under the microscope, but we, you, um, it will be difficult to identify and distinguish from other bacteria. And so the, the aid of a stain helps us to actually see and distinguish the spores from other uh, spores that will be present in the sample. Um, and also a question here from Karen Eaton. Is the hook milk test valid for either fire brood? If so, can you get direction for its use? Um, it's still valid. The whole um, milk test is still valid. But however, we, um, uh, we don't carry out that um, test because of the more effective tools that we use to diagnose. So uh, it's not something that we employed in diagnosing samples. Uh, we should have um, a copy in our diagnostic manual um, that, ex that talks about the whole meat test. Uh, another question here from Massey, uh, are there multiple, are there multiple strains of EFB? If so, how many strains have been identified? Um, um, that's something recently we, um, we were talking about with Jay Evans, and um, there, there have been reported different strains of EFB, and the further studies actually is needed to clarify the type of strains that are present here in the US. And so, uh, yes, the small work needs to be done on the identifying the strains that are the different strains of EFB in the US. Um, this question about um, um, killing AFB spores. Um, if um, I'm sorry, uh, does autoclaving kill AFB spores? Um, yes, um, and actually we have tried that in our lab, um, but you need a high pressure and high temperature uh, for a long period of time to actually kill the AFB spores. Uh, and a question by David Magnus. If the beekeeper has been tr treated with an antibiotic, do you, your test show AFB? Um, yes, it will. Um, it will not kill the spores. So none of the treatments 
that are available not all, or none of the antibiotics can kill the, the spores. So we can still detect the spores. Um, a question by Barbara Brasher. If in a if in a yard of 20 colonies, one or two colony have a, one frame of capped brood with some cells showing AFB symptoms, including roping an inch. So that colony be born or just the affected frame be burned. Um, if the colony, if that frame actually shown a ropiness, which means the, the, the actual disease is already established in that colony. And so it's, it's much, it's, at that stage it's highly contagious. And so even though you may not see all the combs with the, with the disease, it's actually those spores will actually will have already um, infecting other cells. Uh, it's just a matter of time for those cells to develop um, full-blown disease. And so, yes, it, um, I mean, they can try shaking off the bees and, and hopefully treating um, and, you know, transfer them to a new um, hive body and treating those colonies, um, those bees, but you only can max so much the symptoms in the hive. So it, it will be best to actually isolate and, and if possible, get rid of the colony because eventually, if it will take some time, but eventually the disease will actually progress and you have full blown disease in that in that colony. Um, uh, Alice Rowan, uh, do you ever take college interns in your lab? Um, yes. So we do take college interns in our lab. Um, every year we get um, students that apply for um, internship and they, they go to the vetting system and then we accept um, um, them for um, internship. Um, and so some students will not only work in uh, our lab, the diagnostic lab, but also the other um, research lab and help with research projects. Um, so Maria, I have a question about, uh, let's see here. Where do you recommend uh, we send dead bees to test for pesticides? Um, I think the, uh, the US AMS National Service, National Science Lab in um, Gastonia, North Carolina, I believe still accepts sample for pesticides analysis. Um, David asks, how do you collect a comb sample from a frame with plastic foundation? Uh, that's a good question uh, and that one that we get all the time. Um, and so uh, you can carefully scrape off the comb of the foundation, or you can use a knife to cut the, um, cut the two by two inches from the boot chamber. Um, uh, and, but, that way you, you would destroy the comb. So maybe that will not be a valuable um, solution. But if you can carefully scrape off the comb, um, you can send that in for analysis. So we have enough material to actually examine. Uh, so Ray asks, which USDA lab is providing guidance on APIVA treatment um, resistance? Um, I don't know if any of our sister lab that are providing that service, uh, but I do know that um, uh, one of our scientists are actually working on uh, um, uh, testing those um, 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 viral, viral site treatment. So, uh, but I'm not sure specifically if they're working on APVAR. See. Let's see if another question here of um, um, Anthony asks, um, what role have you played in training veterinarians in becoming knowledgeable in beekeeping to assume their role with 
feed directives? Uh, uh, that's a good question, Anthony. Um, I try to um, um, give presentation um, wherever needed, um, veterinary groups. And I think that's um, pretty much the role I will continue to play in helping them understand the world, how we can help um, them in understanding the disease, um, both American and European firewood and the treatments that are, uh, how to apply those treatments in the war and how they can also help beekeepers. Uh, um, Pauline asks, um, can AFB, um, sorry, can AFB seen in, in diff, uh, different quick, uh, diff quick stain or gram stain or myelin, uh, methylene blue? Um, um, methylene blue, um, gram stain and methylene blue stain have used, and yes, we can we can see AFB spores in that. Um, the diff quick stain, um, I'm not familiar with. So, okay, this question about the slide of our address and contact. Okay, I will put the. Uh, the slide up with the uh, contact information on it. Uh, let's see. So let me go to more questions. Um, we have um, Jack um, asked, um, with the advance of um, plastic, foundation, plastic foundation burning for American fiber is out of the question for the small beekeeper. What are other options? Um, um, so, yes, uh, small beekeepers will be very devastated if they have American firewood. Um, but pretty much there's not much option in terms of controlling the disease once it's, um, uh, the colony is, is affected. And so uh, I'm not sure what other option I can suggest, but um, maybe somebody else may have other ideas uh, on that. So uh, Trevor asks, what is the best way for sideline beekeepers to sanitize wooden equipment, including frame? Um, I've heard that um, um, bleach solution um, is effective to sanitize colonies, um, um, hive body, um, but not if it's, um, um, affected colony of um, American firewood. Uh, maybe if you have just um, just want to clean up the the uh, the wood the wooden um, box, um, maybe you can use um, um, bleach solution. Uh, what else? Let's see. Um. I Somebody has asked, how long do EFB spores stay viable in stored comb? Um, um, that um, we know that um, the the um, the cells um, will last some time, but um, not too long if it's not in in a, in a good condition. And so I'm not pretty sure um, for the um, study will we, we need to be done to determine how long how long they will stay viable outside uh, of the host. But um, yes, I'm not sure how long um, it will stay um, viable. Um, so the question on Neonat, if autoclaving kills AFB spores on B wax, what pressure and temperature and how how much time will you use? Um, uh, in terms of duration, um, uh, over um, over an hour or two, uh, we have tried, um, and also um, let's see.
a question by Barbara. I thought that if we script the script the sample from plastic comb, the diagnosis is hard to obtain. That if you need the cells intact or smear samples, uh, yes, it's it's hard to obtain. But um, if that's all you have, <laughs> um, yes, then we we uh, we will try to examine the sample. But yes, we we'll prefer just to send the the comb intact or a smear. Um, Pauline, about uh, sensitivity for FB, can you please repeat? Uh, yeah, so I talked about the um, testing AFB spores against antibiotics that are um, uh, available. And so, yeah, so we do, um, we do um, cultural AFB spores and then we test them against um, oxytexacycline and tylosine. And, and we'll, we're, we're looking for the, um, to see if the actual antibiotic will inhibit the growth of the AFB spore or, or if the AFB spore is, is resistant to the anti antibiotic. And in that case, and so we want to know which antibiotics will be effect, will be effective if if the beekeeper is allowed to treat a colony, say a colony that is is um, infected with um, European fibroid. Um, Philip, um, I have a question about EFB uh, found spores, or is that just does? Yes, so um, EFB is a, a cell-forming bacteria, whereas AFB is a cell. Uh, EFB is a self uh, cell-forming bacteria, whereas AFB is a spore-forming bacteria. Um, so Dennis, what the benefit of it? Um, Uh, so Pauline is asking, what kind of culture do we use? Um, we use a um, so we use a brain art infusion agar to culture um, European American fibroid spores. So so. I, I hope I answer most of the questions. If I don't, um, 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 be sure to remind me again um, which one I missed. Um, so here's our address, mailing address, um, if you uh, want to submit samples to the lab. And I'll go. Um, David asks if the if the colony is treated with teramycin, if the actual uh, um, colony will still carry the disease. Uh, 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 yes, it will still carry the disease. Um, in general, the, the um, in European fibroid, um, the actual um, teramycin just, just marks the disease and prevents the um, adult bees um, from actually transmitting the uh, the disease and so, but it will not actually get rid of the, um, um, over time it will get rid of the, so those all the, the bees will um, pass on and, and so we reduce the, the transmission of the disease. In some cases, um, requeening the colony also reduce the um, actual disease present in the um, colony. All right, thank you for your attention and have a good evening. All right, Everyone. thank you very much.